The Cargill Foundation, supported by Cargill Incorporated, serving agriculture and industry for over 100 years, and by the members of Channel 2. A pair of 400-pound orphans at home and a baby's first tentative steps. I'm E.G. Marshall. Join me for Elephant, a new National Geographic special that looks at the life and times of an awesome giant. An all-new National Geographic special, Wednesday night at 7. I don't suppose you're here to cheer me up. I just don't want to get out of here. A young woman faced with losing her home and family learns about independence. If this doesn't work, you're out of a job, and you need me too. American Playhouse presents Stacking. The drama of American Playhouse, Wednesday night at 8. You're watching KTCA-TV, Channel 2. The following is a production of KTCA, a Minnesota original. From the Hennepin Center for the Arts, it's Land of Loons 2, featuring the comedy of Jeff Cesario, Alex Cole, Susan Voss, Bill Arnold, Marilyn Belgum, Scott Burton, and a special guest appearance by Louie Anderson. And now, for the vocals of More by Four. They have a new expression on Lobo Holloway that tells you when a party is ten times more than gay. To say that things are jumping, he's not a single down. Let everything is in full swing when you hear somebody jumping. Woo! This Jonas jumping, yeah, it's really jumping. So come and catch and check your hands down. Me, the Jonas jumping, the piano's thumping. Woo! Dance is bumping. This your spot is more than hot. I mean, the Jonas jumping. You better take your whip. Turn leather on the floor, grab anybody's daughter. The roof is rocking, y'all. The neighbors not dead. We're all bummed when the wagon comes. I mean, the joint is jumping. David Wood, uh, yeah, thanks, and uh, <laughs> welcome to Land of Loons 2, of course, the sequel to Land of Loons 1. It's just like any other sequel, like Rocky 2 or Rambo 2, except we're going to be using the verbs here tonight, so <laughs> very good, very good. <laughs> uh, we, have, we have a great show. We, more by four will be back. We have jugglers, we have comedians, we have magicians, and uh, I'm kind of up here uh, I'm seeing the show, really. Actually, I was in law school, and I dropped out to become a comedian. So, uh, yeah, my parents are very proud. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've been working out, too. I've been trying to get in shape. I, you know, I run. When I come back to Minnesota, I run the lakes. But uh, today, I picked the wrong one, Superior. Whoa! Woo! And you ever hear about runner's highs? That should get high from running. Come on. Running is nothing but pain. I mean, if you get high from running, just think how stoned you get if you slam your finger in the car door. with that. <laughs> It's like, ah! <laughs> oh, yeah! Woo -hoo -hoo! What do you got? Four doors? <laughs> all right, all right. You guys are fired up. I'm going to bring out our first act now, and this guy is really great. 
He's really a comics comic. He uh, recently appeared on uh, Showtime's Jimmy Walker and Friends. He's made several appearances on the David Letterman Show and recently made his debut on The Tonight Show. A big welcome for the comedy of Jeff Cesario. Jeff! <laughs> Thank you very much. Keep it going. David Wood, ladies and gentlemen. Good to see you all. I, uh, I'm Italian. Any other Italians in the room, per chance, tonight? Yeah, three. That's about right for Minnesota. That's the quota. People like Italians. People always think they know me from somewhere. I just got that face. Wherever I am, I look like I work there. Give you an example. I'm standing outside a fancy restaurant waiting for some friends to show up so we can go in and eat. Guy pulls up in a Mercedes, gets out, hands me his car keys, goes into the restaurant. <laughs> so I've had the Mercedes about a month now. <laughs> and his wife is actually a very good cook. She is really... <laughs> Minnesota! Ice fishing country. Ooh, there's a sport I never understood. Whoever came up with ice fishing must have had major marital problems. <laughs> Some guy lying in bed at four in the morning looking at his wife thinking, damn, I'd rather be sitting in a cardboard box out on a frozen lake. <laughs> what the hell happened to my life? I just want to be somewhere really cold alone. <laughs> Catholic. I haven't been to church in about 16 years. But... <laughs> I'm actually uh, investigating other religions and theologies. I kind of like it. It's fun. I go out to the airport to shop for religions. <laughs> Most of your great theologies have a representative at the airport handing out literature. Ever seen those people at the airport for these bizarro religions? They're no, they're in, I don't know, cults of some sort. They always send the guys with the honey glaze on their eyes and you just get so aggressive, you got something to prove. I feel bad for him. I want to go up to him and go, hey man, my girlfriend dumped me in high school too, just snap out of it. <laughs> want to help me find something? Help me find gate 33, okay? <laughs> Some people get into something so weird, they just, they're on that cloud, their whole life. They, oh, they got that buzz. They're so happy all the time. They shove their happiness down our throat. You know, I'm so happy. I tell you, I could get hit by a bus tomorrow and I'd die with a smile on my face. Maybe if you got hit from behind. <laughs> Nobody's that hip they can stare down a greyhound doing 50 on the sidewalk and smile, okay? I don't buy it. I don't think so. I'm a big fan of reality. That's why I watch the news and so much sports on TV, because that's real to me. Everything else we got. People believe it if they see it on TV. There was a, uh, there was a show on the other night on cable, special on the Bermuda Triangle. And my friends believed it. People disappear without a trace in the Bermuda Triangle. And these people who disappear, you know where they are? Bermuda! Who always disappears in the Bermuda Triangle? Some poor sap with six kids in college, a huge mortgage, and a witch for a wife. Oh, he disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle. That's why he took his golf clubs with him, right? Real things scare me, too. It takes something real to scare me. Like the earthquakes in California, that kind of scary. Although I think they might just be God's way of saying, stop collecting stupid knickknacks. They might be. <laughs> Let the Elvis creamer fall off your shelf. Okay? <laughs> you know what's so funny out there? They say animals can sense the earthquake coming. They actually claim dogs can tell when an earthquake is coming. <laughs> right. A dog. This is an animal that can't even tell I still have the ball in my hand. <laughs> now suddenly he's nature's seismologist. <laughs> Where's the epicenter, Rusty? <laughs> I 
take something real to scare me, though. Reality scares me. Phony things have never uh, frightened me. Horror movies, other people walk out of a horror movie scared. I walk out thinking, next time, don't dawdle in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> Buy your home from a reputable realtor. <laughs> Real things scare me. You ever been driving on the highway late at night? You start to fall asleep at the wheel. That's right. You try to wake up, you drink some coffee, you're juicing gum. The only thing that's really going to wake you up when you're driving tired is a near fatal accident. <laughs> I don't care how drowsy you are. You knock your side view mirror off on a bridge abutment doing 60, you're awake. <laughs> you're not just awake, you're singing on a wonderful day like today. <laughs> Handguns scare me, and more and more people have them. They're so easy to get. I think the only requirement for getting a handgun is like exact change. <laughs> <That's> a... <laughs> those, those should be the toughest laws we have. Any little thing should keep you from getting a handgun. <laughs> kind of funny eyes should keep you from getting... <laughs> you walk into the gun store, I'd like to see what you have in a silence. <laughs> Sometimes small things can scare me. Spiders will scare me. Middle of the night, you get up, you gotta go into the kitchen, get something to drink. You hit that light switch and there's a spider on the wall. That scares me because other insects run from light and that's fine. They freeze right when you're Spiders actually think, yeah, eight hairy legs, a dark brown body. I can blend into this white tile. <laughs> hey, how's she gonna read that magazine all rolled up like that? <laughs> Listen, you guys have been tremendous. Thanks very much. See you later. a great show. Our next performer is one of the hottest acts in the Twin Cities. She's opened up for people like uh, Doc Severinsen, Robert Goulet, the Smothers Brothers. She really knows what's so funny about being female. A nice warm welcome for the comedy of Susan Voss. Susan! Yeah. <laughs> You may remember that at that time, I pledged from this very stage to lose 30 pounds in 1987. And I am quite thrilled to come before you this evening and tell you that I only have to lose eight more pounds to get back to where I was when I... <laughs> no, <sorry. sighs> Thank you very much. I am darn proud. And uh, the weight thing is such a drag. It is such a drag. And I said, I cannot do this alone anymore. I need a support group. And uh, I joined TOPS. Uh, not the one you might have heard of. Take off pounds sensibly. Kind of an esoteric splinter group off that. It's uh, tomorrow or pretty soon. That's what it is. And... <laughs> See, what, what we do, uh, we taper off gradually, eliminating one food a week. And uh, this week, we're cutting out parsley. Just... <laughs> Completely cold turkey on that. So. It is a good group, and it gives you some excellent low-calorie snack suggestions. And you, you seem like such a smart hip group. You probably already knew this. But I found out there are only 50 calories in a cup of popcorn. Did you know that? Well, sure, I, I find out the next week that the cup already popped. Because <laughs> it makes about a bushel and a half, you know. And... I'm sitting there with the laundry basket, <laughs> watching television, going, this is too good to be true. <laughs> it is not enough nowadays to be slender. You also have to be in shape, you know, and it's so unfair. And my husband is an exercise fanatic. He runs all the time, works out with weights. Now he's into sports nutrition. He's got this new book, Eat to Win. Have you seen this thing at all? It's a terrible thing. I mean... Frankly, I am just not that competitive, 
you know. Uh, <sighs> eat the place, eat the show is good enough for me. You know? <laughs> Now, I do have a theory. I think people who exercise too much rob their brains of valuable oxygen. Uh, maybe it's a little headband. I don't know. Because you watch an Olympic athlete like Mary Lou Retton, incredible Olympic athlete, watch her in her Wheaties commercial, dribbling that cereal down her chin. I mean, I'm sorry. I may not be able to do a vault over a horse and land in the splits, but when it comes to eating, by God, I hit my mouth every time. <laughs> I am a mother. I, uh, I have a teenage son, and he is an excellent student. It has uh, been very fun raising him. He is good in almost all subjects. He is not good in art. Art is his worst subject. And uh, he came home at the marking period with this green and purple basket. And uh, he had a D plus on it. And <laughs> I don't mind telling you, I was a little steamed uh, because I had done well over half of that thing. And it... <laughs> I thought it was a darn fine basket, you know. I would like to see the other mother's baskets, you know. But... <laughs> he is also a very fussy eater. He's, uh, he's at that stage of teenagehood now where he thinks the four food groups are salt, sugar, grease, and a beverage. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Very fussy. And I am not a fussy eater. You know, possibly fooled you on this. Um, <laughs> I'll eat pretty much anything. Uh, I've eaten like a four-year-old milk dud that I found in the bottom of my purse. Do you, know? <laughs> Do you find that stuff? <laughs> you find that lifesaver and you go, I could wash this off. not a good air traveler, I must admit. How many others here are a little bit scared of flying? Any, anybody scared? Are you? Oh, God, I am terrified right off the bat. Why do they have to call an airline depot a terminal? <laughs> I, immediately, I am upset. And I, I find the big commercial flights, they are scary. But how many of us on business, perhaps island hopping, have been on one of these little four-seater beachcraft bonanzas? Who's been on one of these? Have, this is really a scary deal. Okay, now, I am never, ever going again on anything where they don't want to know your name, just your body weight. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? And I am telling you, ladies and gentlemen, this is the first time in your life you do not lie. <laughs> no, we're not talking driver's license here, you know. <laughs> you want to give them a lot of slack. 650 pounds. <laughs> Maybe 800 with the purse. Thank you, Ooh, thank you very much. Thank you. Susan Boss. All right. Now, making money disappear is no trick, but making it multiply in front of your eyes, now that's magic. Our next performer is one of the top comedy magicians in the country. He's a regular at my club, David Woods Rib Tickler, here in Minneapolis. A big hand for the comedy and magic of Mr. Bill Arnold. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David Wood. David didn't mention, but I'm from Edina. And, yeah, I know. I sort of have a clean-cut image, and I know that. I can't get away from it. But don't let that fool you for a minute. Because when I was growing up in Edina, I was in a youth gang. <laughs> I was. I was. We didn't, uh, we didn't have knives, though. We had cutlery sets. And uh, I get a lot of people tell me I don't look like a magician. And a lot of you are thinking, gosh, Bill, if you had a tambourine in your hand, you'd look like Danny Partridge. So <laughs> what I, what I want to do is a little credibility survey tonight. So I'd like to start off by borrowing from someone in the audience a $100 bill, and keys to a small German high-performance car. So who's got 100? <laughs> who's got 100? Anyone? Oh, gentleman in the front. You've got a $100 bill on you. Excellent. All right. Ooh, a Franklin. Big spender. 
How many of you out there believe, by round of applause, by the power vested in me, I could take this $100 bill, tear it in half, and restore it back to its original state? Applaud if you think I can do that. Very nice. Very nice, but that's not even half of you, and there's uh, no sense in me busting my hump for half of you. <laughs> now, my next trick is kind of a jumbo car trick. If you would give these a nice shuffle, mix them up with both hands, it's a motor skill. <laughs> All righty. It's good. Oh, boy, you got these way out of order. <laughs> Are you afraid of fire? No. You are now. <laughs> All right, pick any card you like. everyone can see it. Give everyone, give everyone a chance to see it. All right. All right, stick it back in the deck wherever you like. Okay, okay shuffle. Well, you guys act like you've seen this before. Oh, oh, you know how it works. It's the warm one, right? Forget it. All right. How about a trick with a live animal now? You guys are wrecking it for the people in the back. They were buying the live animal thing right from the start. Thanks a lot. All right, now, uh, whose hundred is this? Yours? All right, here you go. Now, what is, what is your name? Mark. Now, you came here hoping to have fun tonight, didn't you, Mark? Fun times are expensive, Mark. You should know that by now. Watch very carefully and never take your eye off the bill because at no point... And at no time will this $100 bill leave your eyesight. And at no point and at no time have my fingers left my hands. <laughs> Not only have I restored his $100 bill, but I've cashed it in for two crisp 50s. You people act like you watch this stuff all day long, do you? <laughs> Let's give him a big hand. There we go. Thank you very much. Well, you're not buying this either, are you? All right, my last trick is something I want to I want to teach you because it's always fun to know a trick. And uh, all you need for this trick is a small pocket handkerchief, and you take the hanky and poke it into your closed fist like this. You reach into the pocket, wave the magic dust over the hand, and produce an egg. Ooh, uh, that's pretty cool, huh? <laughs> now, I'm going to show you step by step how to do this. So here's how it's done. Some of you might be disappointed. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a hollowed out egg. You got to hollow it out, and uh, that's all you need. But I think most of it is in the presentation. Now, here's how to present it. When I reached up for the silk. That's when I went into the pocket and grabbed the egg. Then you take the silk, poke it into the egg like so. And the rest is showmanship. You wave the hand, produce the egg. Except I like to use two eggs when I do it. And <laughs> as you can see, there is number one. There is number two. Gosh, honey, let's get there early so we get good seats, huh? <laughs> I want a lot more 
encouragement. Let's hear it. I'm a magician, not an idiot. You guys have been great. Thanks very much. Good night. God bless. Bill Arnold. All right. Nice job, Bill. Nice job. The Twin Cities have become a nationally known hotbed for all types of entertainment. Our next performers truly back up that claim. Led by their founder, pianist Sanford Moore, they do jazz like nobody's business. One more time, let's hear it for More by Four. You got the change of the new You got no bounce in my shoes. You got no fancy to take on. No, I ain't got nothing but the blue. Our next performer has a style all her own. She's warm, she's caring, she's nurturing, and I think most important of all, she's from Fridley. She's a fresh new face on the Twin Cities comedy scene. She's a woman you can't lose in the crowd. A hand for the comedy of Marilyn Belgum. Marilyn! Oh dear, all 
the world's a stage, and all the women merely players. Each one makes her entrance and her exit, and in her time eats many rolls. <laughs> oh, I'm so terribly sorry. <laughs> in her time plays many roles. <laughs> Not bad for an amateur writer. I just wrote it motoring down from Fridley. <laughs> uh, I, uh, well, I tell you, uh, I like to dress this way because I think this is how every woman sees herself in her inner heart. Ladies, on that day when you thought you were going to live happily ever after, <laughs> remember that day? <laughs> remember you turned to him at the altar and you said, a wider world of hope and joy I see because you come to me. Remember that day? <laughs> Isn't this more or less what you had in mind? Uh, I know I did. <laughs> I was so incredibly romantic. I could see it at the time. The round table in the kitchen. A little wind blowing over the blue and white checkered tablecloth. The children seated around the table, matching knives and forks. <laughs> saying grace. <laughs> and then exchanging pleasantries with each other. I don't know what happened to you. <laughs> uh, speaking of not knowing what happened, how many in this room have given birth to a teenager? <laughs> how many have a live teenager in their home at the moment? <laughs> if you have the strength, raise your hand. <laughs> Lady, don't give up, will you? Do not give up. Because there comes that wonderful time in life that I like to think of as the role reversal. It happened to me just today. I, I was coming over here, stepped out the door, and my son, Rolf, stepped up to me. I should tell you, Rolf is 18 years old, a freshman at the university. <laughs> Rolf's the last of six. <laughs> last one's gone. Yeah. First one's back. <laughs> oh, oh dear. I know what the Bible means now. The last shall be first. <laughs> and you know that old nursery rhyme? Leave them alone and they'll come home. <laughs> dragging their children behind them. <laughs> no, to get back to the role reversal, I came out, my, Rolf came up to me, he says, Ma, how many of you have heard that sound? <laughs> I call it the generation gasp. <laughs> he says, Ma, you're not going out the door looking like that, are you? <laughs> I said, Rolf, I'm going to tell you something. I am 63 years old. I drive a car. I have a valid driver's license. I earn money and I can do anything I want to do, and you can't stop me. Oh, <laughs> oh it was a heady moment. <laughs> oh, it was a heady moment. I just walked away. Uh, my husband isn't romantic anymore. Today he said to me, he said, dear, do you know that big black plastic garbage bag on the back porch? <laughs> I said, I've met it, I don't know it real well. <laughs> He says, oh, don't get so surly. You know, they talk. Don't get so surly. I'm just trying to help you and tell you that it has split open. <laughs> but he said, I think if you hold the split side close to your chest when you carry it out, everything will be okay. <laughs> you men, you men can see, I don't even have a chest, do I? I have a bosom, and when he was romantic, he used to say, Hold the split side close to your bosom. I almost didn't carry it out. But I am getting a little bit famous. Did you see my picture in the Fridley Focus? <laughs> Actually, today when I was coming over here, I came to a complete stop at the uh, entrance to the freeway. The nicest young man on a motorcycle came up to me, you know, big helmet, leather jacket, you know, the type. <laughs> his name was Harley Davidson. <laughs> so cute, his mother had stenciled it right on. And, he, uh, and you know, he recognized me, I could tell, because he waved at me. <laughs> it was just a few fingers, but he waved. <laughs> um, you know, you cannot tell me young people are going to the dogs when they will recognize and wave at a senior citizen. <laughs> I love young people. I love you. I, I, tell you, I always perform with young people, and they're so nice to me. Whenever I go on the stage, they always yell, break a hip. <laughs> Thank you.
Nice job, Marilyn Dogum. Nice job. All right. Juggling can be hazardous to your health unless you're as skilled as our next performer. He combines frantic energy with high voltage comedy. Hang on to your seats. Here comes Scott Burton. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. I'm very. <laughs> you don't mean that. You don't mean that. Uh... Well, what I'm going to do, of course, I'm going to start right off pretty much right off the bat with, with, with the judge. With the... <laughs> we, we got the front row going, oh, great juggling shows. I'll tell you, this, this is the designated lobotomy section of Amity Mary. very, oh, like, look at this, a boneless woman. Nothing. It's, it, it's like, so who do I make that check out to anyhow? I don't, you, let's hope you're not in aerobics, because you're out of here. You're, you're the Gumby woman, is what you are, and, and that pretty much makes you pokey, pal. Sorry about that. Nothing, nothing he's going to be singing about, but you got to live with it. What am I going to do? I'm, in fact, a juggler. I'm going to start with the three most difficult tricks a juggler can do with the three juggling clubs. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, no, no, no. No, no. no, no. no, no. Don't, don't, don't do it even it. I was just going for cheap applause. But here we go. For you punk fans. Um, uh, but anyhow, this is what I do for a job. Now, now first of all, I'm, I'm a juggler. My parents, my parents pushed me to, I'm a large juggling family. My parents would always buy me all the juggling toys. Check this out. These are the first toys my parents ever got me. Look at these, baby. There you go, Scott. Go out and play, buddy. And, uh, you know, I, I always got in a, I, I remember first day of school. You know, show and tell, brought these to school, got sent right to the principal's office. You know, I hated that. You know, big deal. That teacher kind of walked with a limp anyhow. Um, uh, <laughs> I try to get my job, try to get the first job over at the state fair. They turn me down. Uh, you know, I figured just to stay in the atmosphere. I get a job with one of those carny guys, those grease balls who run the rides. There's a life. And uh, they, they turn me down, too. Uh, apparently, I had too many teeth. And, uh, <laughs> and I used deodorant. So, uh, you know, these guys got criteria. But juggling, you see, juggling originated in China. Originated in China. Actually, you guys might hear it. These, 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 these are the actual Chinese devil sticks. Um, the Chinese believe that the devil sticks like had a special power that, uh, and, and by the way, thanks. Um, that, that, that believe that special, no, 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 I don't need your pity. Hang on to that. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll need it later. Um, uh, now the, the, whole, the, the Chinese believe the devil sticks like had a special power that could control a man's future and, and determine his destiny. <laughs> they were idiots. It's just a stick. I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a no, 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 please, no. It's not that. Okay, see now, okay. You got the picture. Uh, now, the Chinese in, in, in invented juggling. The first actual juggling props, check this out, were created in Switzerland. Now, look at this, baby. The problem with the Swiss is once these guys get an idea in their heads, um, uh, it's, a, it's a Swiss Army Juggling Club, kids, is what it is. Now, check this out. Everything you'd ever want right here on this baby. You got here toothbrush, spoon, fork, knife. Look at this. Garden weasel. Uh, you don't know when you need one. You got here cordless, cordless phone in the back. And what makes this thing practical, I don't know if you have Swiss Army knives, you have scissors, saws, cute stuff like that. You're out camping in the woods. I'll show you exactly what you need. Yeah! It's, uh, <laughs> Honey, <laughs> I made this myself. <laughs> what does this guy do with his life? And uh, not much. But anyway, I'm going to do a juggling thing, because that's what I do. I'm here to juggle. I got here three totally different objects. I got to do it real quick. I got here, first object, one actual bottle of wine. Uh, not an ordinary wine. It, it's an Iowan wine. Ooh, boy. Uh, it, it, it's a unique blend of Concord grapes and pork. Boy, what a taste treat. <laughs> Called Waterloo Goo. Give that a shot there, pal. Um, second object, I got here, is one actual peanut butter stamp. I'd like to borrow a third object. Can I borrow from anybody all a shoe? I promise to give it back. Anyone got a shoe? You got one. Well, thank you so much. That's yours, wasn't it? That was that. What is your name, ma'am? Mary, can I just call you Janet? Okay, right. You're, you're never alone with schizophrenia. All right, um, uh, college students go, I got that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Ooh. Okay, um, okay, juggle all three objects, bottle sandwich, stinky shoe. Looks like this. Oh, man. There was an odor eater in here. You lost. <laughs> lost big time. You're going to get another one. Okay, watch this. All three objects, bottle sandwich, shoe. Looks like this. And uh, thanks again. Uh, no, 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 no. Save it, save it, save it. No. Okay. Most of you people, most of you people figure this out. This is the trick. What I'm going to do while juggling these three totally different objects, I'm going to attempt to eat 
Okay. <laughs> you got the relatively intelligent people going, ooh, go see the sandwich. <laughs> okay, here we go. Set up. Uh, one more, go quick. No, stay, stay, no, stay, stay. There we go, one Former is a St. Cloud, Minnesota native. Over the past 10 years, he has performed at over 1,000 colleges and universities across the country. He recently signed a deal with ABC TV, and we've got him now. Please welcome the comedy of Alex Cole. Thank you very much. My name is Alex Cole. Um, I've been a comedian for a little over 12 years, about 12 and a half years. I've only been funny about a year and a half, though, so... <laughs> yeah. I'm married, I have three children, three sons. My three sons. I named them Rob, Chip, and Ernie. And, uh... No, I didn't. You know, it never fails. After I'm done working, after the show, someone will always come up and say, is that true, do you really have kids? You know, like, I'd make that up for the sake of a show. But I do. I, I think it's I don't look like a dad, you know? No, I see you shaking your head. I even asked a friend of mine, I said, do I look like a dad? And he says, yeah, but not a good one. As you probably can tell, I'm the goofy dad in our neighborhood. Think back when you were a child. There was always the goofy dad, the dad the kids love because he lets them, I let him do anything. I let him eat dirt. I don't care. I give him spoons, bowls. I eat dirt with them. It's a, it's a party. We rub it all over our face. And then they go home to their parents, of course, and their parents go, what the heck are you doing eating dirt? Well, Mr. Cole ate dirt. Well, he's a goofy moron, for God's sake. The kids are so honest. Little Joey comes up to me and says, my daddy says you're a goofy moron. Your daddy's a very smart dude. And that night I slashed the tires on his truck, so... <laughs> Every neighborhood has the goofy dad. Every neighborhood has the neighborhood screamer. Does that ring a bell? Hmm? The parent who never knows where their kid is. So anytime they want them, they just holler out the window for them. And the moms do the in most interesting thing. They sing the message. They add a melody, because they think it goes farther. How many times have you heard this on a hot summer afternoon? Michael! <laughs> Come on home and eat. Right? And, and the kids answer back. They'll be a block away. What do we have? They are carrying on a conversation for a quarter of a mile. Can I bring Billy home to eat with us? How many times have you heard this answer? I'm not feeding the whole damn neighborhood. So every neighborhood has that parent. Every neighborhood, no matter where you grew up, what part of the country, always had the mean dad. Does that ring a bell? Might have been your dad, maybe. You know who I'm talking about? The dad who's half dad, half psychopath. <laughs> I mean, his kids are scared of him. You're scared of him. Your parents are scared. The police are scared of this guy. In our neighborhood, his name was Wayne. And that's when his kids didn't even call him dad. They called him Wayne. We'd be playing baseball in the street like kids always do. And you do that because there's no windows to break up at the park. Right? Okay, so you'd be playing in there and the ball would roll in Wayne's front yard. And my brother ran to get it. He kept my brother. <laughs> Wayne. And the worst part about it, I think someone was talking about earlier, spanking kids in public. Wayne would spank his, his oldest boy. He'd take him in the middle of the street, pull his pants down, and spank him bare butt. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, and you couldn't laugh either, because he'd spank you too. <laughs> he would. And you couldn't tell your dad, because he'd spank your dad. It didn't matter to him. All the dads knew that. They said, you stay away from Wayne. So we'd be in the street playing ball, we'd see Wayne's truck hit the top of the hill, and the entire neighborhood would freeze with fear when this man came home. It's like we'd see his truck and just, <gasps> Wayne's here. And we'd run and hide. <sharp inhale> we'd be in the bushes peeking out. Shh, quiet. Look out, get down. There he is. And Wayne would get out of his truck, start walking to the house, and squirrels would be running through the yard. Just, <sharp inhale> <sharp inhale> Wayne's here. <sharp inhale> And I'm scared right now just talking about the guy. 
because Wayne could be here. It's going to happen. I'll be doing my show. He'll be sitting ringside. He'll stand up. The whole crowd will go, Wayne's here. <laughs> Most of the trouble I ever got into as a child was because of my little brother. Yeah, because I beat him up. <laughs> Check this out. This is the grossest thing I used to do to him. I used to go out when he's sleeping and get my beater tennis shoes. You know which ones? The ones that smell so bad you got to leave them outside at nighttime. And I'd pick the rankest one of the two, just... Oh, yeah. And I'd climb up the ladder, hold it right over his nose. <laughs> Suck it in. <laughs> Suck it in. <laughs> and at the right moment, I would plunge down to... Boom. Suck it in. And he'd fight it really hard, too. But when you first wake up, you're weak and you can't do nothing, you know. Finally, he'd get his strength back. He'd poke me in the eye. Bam! Bam! And he'd run in my parents' room. All of a sudden, I hear, get in here! God, I forgot I had parents. <laughs> and I, I get in my dad's bedroom, and, and, and my little brother's doing the wimpy brother act, because they always did it. They, just, they had that lip hanging out. Just <laughs> <laughs> Runny nose, you know. Just, I mean, hell, I felt sorry for him. You know, just, and dads all look alike at four in the morning. No matter where you grew up, your dad goes up. the hell's going on in there? <laughs> um, uh, nothing. <laughs> what do you mean nothing? He said you put a tennis shoe on his face. He said suck it in, suck it in. <laughs> um, sorta. <laughs> what do you mean sorta? How would you like it if I put a tennis shoe in your face and suck it in, suck it in? And like an idiot, I go, I wouldn't care. <laughs> so wham, he put a tennis shoe in my face and tied the laces in a knot. <laughs> Listen, you've been a wonderful crowd. Thank you so much. Thank you. Keep it going, Alex Cole. Yeah, nice shot. Our next performer is a name synonymous with comedy in Minnesota. He's made numerous appearances on The Johnny Carson Show. He's had his own special on Showtime. We caught up with him at the Guthrie Theater. Ladies and gentlemen, Louie Anderson! So it's nice to be here. We have beautiful weather, don't we? That's what people are most happy about in Minnesota. I don't care what anyone says. That's the first thing you think about. You'll ask people, you won't watch the news. You ask people who have been out. The ones who've been out, that's who you ask. How is it out? <laughs> that's what you want to know. Okay. What's it like out? Is it nice out? Or what is it, a jacket, a sweater, what, an overcoat? What, I need my jumper cables or what? Is it slick out or is it dry? Is the driving slick? Slick, 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 you better stay in. Slick. <laughs> it's true. You ever notice that? Your dad always said, Slick out, now watch it. <laughs> Go a mile and a half. <laughs> cars are important. They are. We love our cars. You'll wake people up if you get a new car. Hey, get up! Got a new car. Come down and see it. <laughs> Just got it. New car. Really, what you're proud. People are proud. New car. <laughs> Just got it. New car. <laughs> you show it to people. You don't even say words. You make sounds. Huh? <laughs> show the features on it. Huh? <laughs> 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 when you're with a new uh, car, somebody, you're with somebody who has a new car, you're with them and they're going to park it? How far you have to walk from where you're going? <laughs> I'm 
going to park here in Wisconsin, and we'll walk over to South St. Paul from there. <laughs> I don't want nothing near it. Park it right in the middle of this lake. <laughs> and if they have a new car, when you do come out of a store, they have to check it over. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and if there is a scratch, we'll free... Oh! Entertain us all night with their superbly arranged swing and show tunes. One more time, four by four. Anyways, we're gonna take a sentimental turn on the old eight train, all right? Okay. If you're ready, grab your bags and let's go.
too. My name's for David Wood. Thank you very much. Goodbye from the land of Luz. And take it home with four by four. All right. Produced by KTCA, a Minnesota original. Land of Loons 2 is a KTCA production, and we'd very much like to hear your comments. If you have comments, give us a call now at 642-1980. That's 642-1980. Or write us here at KTCA. And thanks from Channel 2.